Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. Before we move on to sending geometry data to the engine for rendering, I would like to make the way we pack vertex information a bit more generic and suitable for modern graphics pipelines. Right now we are using a single format for the vertices of a mesh, which as the name indicates only contains vertex information for static meshes. That means that we couldn't use this vertex format for skinned meshes that can be animated using skeletal animation. We have got an intermediate vertex structure here that contains all possible vertex information after the processing step. So let's pretend we could have some joint information in here for skeletal meshes. I'll go into what these mean when we do skeletal animation part of the engine, but in short, joint weights define the amount of influence each joint has on this vertex. In general, up to four joints can act on a single vertex. We need the indices of those joints as well, so we can query their transform matrices in the vertex shader. In addition, I'd also like to support vertex colors in the geometry pipeline. These can have various usages from simply coloring the meshes to texture blending within materials. I also add an array of colors to our mesh data structure here. I won't add data for skeletal animation since we haven't written the code to import animation data from FBX files yet. Of course, not every mesh needs to have all these attributes. In fact, because all meshes have position information, but only differ in other vertex attributes, I would like to only define structures for different combinations of these attributes. I will also refer to these attributes as vertex elements, mostly because it's simpler to type. So first let's define an enumeration, which we can use to figure out what elements can be found in a particular vertex format. All vertices have a position element, so that one is assumed to always be there implicitly. If a vertex has normal information and it's a static mesh, we set the least significant bit. If a mesh uses texture mapping, it means that it must have normal as well as tangent vectors and UV coordinates. We don't support textured meshes without normal information. That's why the least significant bit is set, and the second bit indicates that there is tangent and UV information as well. Finally, we set the third bit if the vertex has color information. Next are the skeletal formats. For vertices of a skeletal mesh, we set the fourth bit. Then we can simply define all other combinations by logically ordering different items. Now I'll create a struct for each one of these combinations. Some engines, if not most of them, use some kind of flexible develop time vertex construction system that lets the user define what goes into vertices. I don't want to introduce that level of complexity at this early stage of our engine development. So we'll predefine all supported vertex formats, which as you can see are not that many. Please pay special attention to the padding of these structures as they literally contain the data that will be uploaded to the GPU. Therefore, I format these structures so that their size is a multiple of 4 bytes. For static meshes with normal information, since we need 1 byte to encode the sign of normal Z component, I add 3 bytes of padding, which also can be used optionally for vertex colors. Textured meshes have two additional 16-bit integers for packed tangent vector values and two floating point values for texture coordinates. That's all for static meshes. Let's continue with vertex formats for skeletal meshes. At a minimum, we need joint weights and joint indices.
If we have color information, we need another 3 bytes and one extra byte for padding. For skeletal meshes with normal information, we put the sign byte in the first padding and add two integers for packed normal vectors. Next combination is skeletal with normal and color information, where we append the color bytes at the end. A skeletal vertex format with texture information has tangent and UV fields added. And finally we pack the skeletal format with textures and colors. Instead of having an array of a specific vertex type in our mesh data structure, I'll add an untyped raw buffer that we can typecast depending on element type. In the same way, we also add a raw buffer to hold vertex positions. Note that now we have three separate buffers for each mesh. One for vertex indices, one for vertex positions, and one for other vertex elements. Another good reason to have a separate position buffer is that it reduces data bandwidth for some rendering passes, such as depth prepass and shadow pass, where only vertex positions are needed. Because we changed our data structure, we now need to update our geometry processing step. First, we need a function that returns the element's data size, depending on the element's type. Here, a simple switch statement will do. Fortunately, the struct names are the same as enumeration item names, so we can use those to get each size. A quick check shows that all sizes are a multiple of 4 bytes. Next, instead of writing a packing function for each element's type, I write one function with again a switch statement to pack the vertices in the raw position and element buffers that we just added. First we make room in the position buffer to hold all vertex positions. I just realized we could have gone with a types array since we know the type of vertex positions, which is a 3D vector of floating point values. I may change that later, but it doesn't have real consequences for the rest of the code anyway. Filling in the position buffer is rather trivial. We simply copy the position values over from the intermediate vertex buffer. Before filling the element buffer, I'll prepare some data depending on the elements type. For example, if we have a mesh with normal vectors, we need to pack each normal vector into 16-bit integers and a sign byte. I then put those calculated values in these arrays to be used when filling the elements buffer. So in case of normals, we determine the sign bit. 
Remember we packed the normal sign in the second bit of t underscore sign. We also packed the normals into 16-bit integers. If the mesh is textured, we pack tangent vectors and add the sign bit to each sign's byte. For skeletal meshes, we pack joint weights in 8-bit integers. This is similar to how we convert color channels from floating points to integer RGB values. Now we have prepared everything that we need in order to fill the vertex element buffer. First we make enough room in the buffer to hold this data. Then depending on element type, we pack our element buffer. For each case, we cast the raw buffer to the element data type and fill in the relevant data. For an element buffer with only color information, we simply fill in the red, green and blue values. Also note the empty padding initializer. For static normal element type, we also fill in the colors, because they could contain values since they are optional, followed by the tangent space signs and the packed normal values. For textured meshes, we add the packed tangent vectors and UV coordinates. If the mesh is a skeletal mesh, we pack joint weights and joint indices. 
Joint indices are cast to 16-bit values because we only support up to about 65,000 joints per geometry, which should be plenty. The rest of skeletal element formats are packed pretty much in the same way as we did for static elements by adding normal tangent and color data. This is all we need for packing vertex buffers. Next, we need to determine what vertex element type we need for each mesh that was processed. Therefore, I add a new function which determines vertex element type, looking at what kind of data is present in the mesh data structure. So, if we have normals and also UVs, then we know that we at least have a static mesh with normals and textures. If we don't have UVs on the other hand, we have a static mesh with normals and so on. We don't have enough information yet to determine other types of elements, so this will do for now. We'll come back later and expand this function when we have skeletal meshes and such. We don't need this packing function anymore, so I'll remove it. And finally, at the end of processing stage, we determine what kind of mesh we ended up with and pack its vertices for that element type. This is all I wanted to do for today's video. Next time, we are going to continue and integrate this new way of packing vertices in the rest of the geometry pipeline. Thank you so much for joining me, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time. Until then, take care and happy game engineering.